So today we are talking about innovations in transportation to both sustain and expand mobility within and between our communities across the U.S. It's no longer conjecture. We already know that a person's direct access to health care, education, jobs, and social opportunities, social uh, economic, social political, social entertainment ac activities is directly correlated to their mobility. It is also critical that our mobility is able to be sustained through climate changes and possibly reverse or eradicate some of the impacts of climate change. So today we have gathered a panel of leaders that are going to tease you with initiatives in the U.S. to transform us to smart cities through the implementation of transportation. We know today's conversation will not answer all your questions, but our goal is to provide enough information to encourage you to do more in your local communities and maybe follow up with some of our panelists to learn more about exactly what they're doing and what opportunities they have for you. So let us start with some introductions. Uh, as was mentioned, I'm Kimberly Slaughter and I am the CEO of Sistra USA. Sistra is an international consulting firm that does planning, architectural, and engineering consulting services in the transportation space across the world. We are highly focused on providing both strategy and technical excellence for implementing sustainable transportation solutions, not to, to just today's transportation problems or challenges, but for tomorrow's. So let's in, meet our panelists. And we will start with Keith. Do you want to introduce yourself? There should be a microphone in your seat. I do have one. Hi, my name is Keith Kerman. I'm the Chief Fleet Officer for the City of New York and a Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. On behalf of Mayor Erica Adams and our Commissioner Don Pinnock, I want to thank you for having New York City here. Uh, New York City operates the largest municipal fleet in the United States. You all know our vehicles are on TV every night. It's the Police Department, the Fire Department, the Department of Sanitation. Um, add in 10,700 school buses. Um, and so we're trying to do a lot within a critical emergency services environment. Three big things that we'll talk about. Electrify the fleets, um, redesign them for safety, and then make them smarter through telematics and through other implementation. So happy to be here. Thank you. Euless? So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Euless Cleckley, the uh, director and CEO of the Department of Transportation and Public Works here in the great Miami-Dade County. Um, you heard from our mayor earlier, and I know we have many of our department staff there in the crowd, so, so thanks for your attendance. Good to see you, Doug. All right. Uh, so we have 4,000 employees as a part of our Department of Transportation and Public Works. Uh, we handle all things transportation from an infrastructure standpoint for the county. Um, 5,500 miles of roadways, 198 miles of canals, and 190 or so uh, bridges of all types. Uh, 3,000 signals um, this is what we handle on the infrastructure side, but we're also the largest transit agency within the state of Florida and the 15th largest transit agency in the country. Uh, and we have three different modes of transit that we provide. Uh, we have our Metro bus uh, system where we have uh, approximately 99 routes that we provide service throughout the county. We have a Metro rail system, uh, 22 mile, 23 station system, and then we have our people mover system uh, that uh, is a 4.4 mile uh, automated people mover system uh, that takes people to areas downtown. So we do a lot here for South Florida and for Miami-Dade specifically, and I'm excited for today's conversation. Thank you. <laughs> All right, he came with his own fan club. There we go. <laughs> All right, and Ben, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you so much for, thank you, Euless, for playing such gracious hosts. And I know there's some friendly competition between New York and Miami, so I'll try to stay out of it. Um, I'm Ben Levine. I'm a senior advisor for research and technology at the U.S. Department of Transportation. 
and um, we're you know really focused on uh, on supporting the projects that are happening across the country related to the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, yeah, just pleased to to be here and 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 have really enjoyed so many exciting conversations today. All right, excellent, excellent. And uh, I understand that this is this is a little interesting environment up here. This is like doing must be like doing a show on a cruise ship. We can hear all the noise in the background, but that's exciting. We're glad you guys are engaged. Uh, why don't we start with the fact that the Biden Harris administration has taken some major strides in our country uh, to move in the direction of creating smart transportation and implementing in innovations. And most of that is, is coming through the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill that was made into law recently, or it's November of 2021. Am I getting that date right, Ben? So why don't we have Ben tell us a little bit more about uh, the, what the infrastructure law does for us and what are the innovation principles that are embedded in that law? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um Bipartisan infrastructure law, sort of big picture, it's $1.2 trillion. About half of that goes to the US Department of Transportation and will be implemented over the course of the next five years. Um, I think broadly, we are very focused on how do we use the bipartisan infrastructure law to support our policy priorities, safety, climate, equity, economic competitiveness, and, and the idea of transformation. And, uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. I think practically in terms of what does $660 billion mean for cities and communities across the country, there's hundreds of millions going um, through formula funds to state, uh, to state transportation departments and, and transit authorities. And there's a ton of competitive grant programs that are included um, in the bipartisan infrastructure law. So just to give you a flavor of what that looks like, we're talking about tens of billions of dollars that will support nationally significant bridges and port facilities and projects of, of, of regional and national significance for our supply chain and for moving people and goods and for just building critical infrastructure that connects communities. 8.7 billion for uh, climate resilient infrastructure, 7.5 billion for charging infrastructure, 10 billion for low and no emissions buses uh, and school buses, 5 billion for uh, safe streets, a billion for reconnecting communities that are separated by historical uh, transportation investments, and, and there's more resources uh, that have been contributed to that as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. 1.75 billion for, uh, for transit accessibility, 2.25 million for, uh, billion for ports. I could go on, the list is very impressive and I think paints a picture that there are resources to tackle some of these big opportunities, and I think that the way I think about the context of this conference, sort of thinking about smart cities and, and, and digital transformation of our transportation systems is you have those big picture goals of, of equity, climate, uh, climate resilience, building greater systems for, uh, for sort of resilience in our supply chain. And I think that the bipartisan infrastructure law unlocks just tons of resources to address those goals. And then there's more an, a more narrow kind of maybe capital I innovation of what are the resources that are gonna be directed specifically at, um, at kind of like innovation, smart cities, digital transformation. And so we are working on a program called the Smart Grants Program that will be released later this month. That's $500 million to support smart cities and, uh, and, and communities, projects, and deployments. There's another program that uh, goes by the acronym ATTIMD. That's another uh, $300 million to support ITS uh, deployments. We have a $500 million a year, or $500 million total uh, university transportation centers program, and I know there's a number of university transportation centers in South Florida. And so I think that there's also a robust and very directed set of resources that will support innovation and some of the work maybe on the ground that you all are thinking about. But I think the bigger picture is that um, the opportunity is thinking about, you know, what are these uh, top level climate and safety goals and how do we actually think beyond programs that 
just think about technology, but also sort of bring technology into the picture in a number of deployment programs. And so I'll stop there. I think maybe I'll come back to some of the values that we think about, but, um, but maybe that appropriately sets the stage. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those programs in there I'm slightly familiar with, the SMART program. And I was thinking this audience would probably benefit from hearing a little bit more about the SMART program. Can you talk to us about it and exactly what do you expect to achieve yeah, with sure. that SMART program? Absolutely. So uh, many people are probably familiar with the SMART City Challenge um, in 2016, which I think brought uh, was... Uh, a single uh, winner went to Columbus, Ohio, and I think aimed to really create uh, transformative change in a, in a single place in their transportation system. I think we um, recognized that that model had um, did a lot in sort of in terms of bringing sort of like the political energy around a set of problems and really led to some transformative thinking. But we also recognized that the Smart Grants program was included in the bipartisan infrastructure law as part of a five-year transportation plan. And so I think we are, are really focused on institutionalizing that type of activity across the country. And so uh, I mentioned the Smart Grants program is going to be coming out in September, and it will be structured as a two-stage program. And so initially, we will be supporting um, teams uh, that the primary applicant will be state, local, or tribal governments. And we're encouraging partnerships with, uh, with companies, with academic institutions, with community organizations. And they will, they will uh, propose projects that, uh, that uh, kind of address core transportation challenges that use a range of technologies that are articulated in statute that are, include automation, connected vehicles, UAS, systems integration, smart grid, and so really a broad range of, of technologies, but we are incredibly focused on targeting problems that the community is clearly trying to solve, where we know that there's just gonna be a ton of energy, either at the transportation department or a transit agency or a local government, where we are, are sure that those kinds of investments ultimately will lead to really transformative change. And the two-stage nature of a program allows us to initially invest in a planning and prototyping phase, and that's going to be like a $2 million kind of level, followed by a implementation phase. So the, the winners of the planning and prototyping grants will be down-selected uh, to implementation grants that are sort of in the nature of $15 million, and that will enable sort of more broad-scale um, uh, deployment of projects. And I think the grand vision for this kind of a program is that we can seed ideas that then are cultivated, are, are demonstrated locally, and then can become sort of new um, methods that are, are taken on across the country um, as it relates to technology and our transformation system. Uh, Thank technology you. and our transportation system, excuse me. Thank you very much, Ben. Keith, um, I'd like to, to pick on you for a little bit here. Uh, and where I wanna go in the conversation is we talked, you mentioned electric vehicles and we have you know, quite a few Agent, public agencies that are looking at trying to go all electric with their vehicles. I actually was on the West Coast last week having this exact same conversation. Is it really possible for us to go all electric or should we be looking at a combination of, of fuel types? Uh, for instance, I mean, some of the, the topics that were raised last week is not only whether the batteries are truly as reliable as, as manufacturers are saying they are, but we're also seeing some challenges with the reliability of the infrastructure. So can, we, can you provide some insight for us from your perspective? On that? Sure. All right. Thank you very much. So a little background. Um, New York City in the fleet program currently runs the largest, New York, the largest electric fleet in New York State, about 3,600 units, and we'll soon make an announcement about that number expanding um, in the next few days. We operate about 1,270 ports, charging ports, also the largest in New York State. So we're making a lot of progress in electrification, um, and we're doing so in an emergency services environment which is probably the hardest place to make that progress, right? Most of our vehicles are police cars and fire trucks and sanitation, the sheriff, the, the medical examiner. These vehicles are critical service providers. So electrification is real. It's making extraordinary progress. Think about just 15 years ago, they did a documentary, Who Killed the Electric Car, right? They were already talking, you know, electric vehicle industry was, was in such dire straits they were trying to discuss, you know, who, who did it in? Now, maybe we see the opposite. Everybody's saying, oh, electric cars are going to take over everything and everything be an electric car. 
What I can tell you is electric cars are viable. We're using them in tough applications. Um, we are saving money on maintenance and fuel. We've put out publicly, and we can share that, over 60% maintenance savings over the lifetime of vehicles. And we're one of the few organizations that's actually run four or 500 all-electric vehicles through an entire vehicle life. So we've already run them 10, 12 years. We know the full cycle. So very viable. As you go, and certainly light duty, we know we can electrify. We, as you might know, have brought in 220 all-electric vehicles, mostly Mach-E's, into the New York City Police Department and other law enforcement agencies. So we are trying to do electrification as well in law enforcement. New York City Police Department is the largest law enforcement um, local agency in the United States, if not the world. If we can electrify that fleet, you can electrify your police fleets in, in your city and jurisdiction. It is true that, and, and we're making a lot of progress on medium duty. We're about to bring in our first 300 e-transit connect vans, and we operate 7,000 pickups and vans, so if you can make progress there. It is true that heavier trucks, especially emergency services trucks, sanitation trucks that plow, and in New York City our garbage trucks are our plow units, fire trucks to the New York City Fire Department standard, um, you know, emergency service response vehicles for the police department, those are going to be more difficult and they're gonna take longer. In our plan, we're gonna electrify everything by 2035, except those emergency trucks by 2040. In the meantime, going kind of your question, we still think there's opportunity to invest in hybrid vehicles. As we test electric vehicles and policing, we're buying all hybrid police cars for the police department. So you know, we're gonna implement hybrids, get the maintenance, fuel savings, and then work out the issues with electrics. In New York City, every ambulance today is a hybrid ambulance with a plug-in backup, a plug-in option. So we're already making progress on hybrid efficiencies. Then in addition, we are implementing biodiesel and looking to implement renewable diesel, which is a full switch out fuel for um, fossil diesel, mostly sold on the West Coast where they have a low carbon fuel standard in California and Oregon and Washington, something we're working on in New York State. So kind of we have a three part plan. Electrify everything you can as soon as you can as it's viable. On light and medium, we think that's there. On heavy, still some work to do. Um, and by the way, we will publish very soon a report called the Clean Fleet Transition Plan, which we're doing with the United States Department of Transportation, the Volpe Center. Um, and we're excited about your grants, by the way. We're, we're, we're applying today. Some of them are due. Safe Streets is due today. Um, and so we're going to outline exactly where we think electrification can be done today, three to five years, and then where there's work to be done. Electrify where you can as soon as you can. Still implement hybrids and efficiencies from material efficiencies to looking at you know, stop-start start technology, alternative power unit technology. So still look at efficiencies in hybrids. And then everywhere you're still using diesel fuel, which is going to be heavy trucking for a while, off-road equipment, we operate 5,000 off-road equipment, construction equipment. Uh, equipment. Um, fun fact, New York City operates 300 agricultural tractors, and I can try and explain to you why that is, but it's true. Um, go, to, uh, go to renewable fuels, and, and really there's an exciting fuel, if you've never heard about it, called renewable diesel, full switch out fuel, meets the diesel specification, very viable. And so that's kind of our three-part plan with, we want to electrify, we do understand, especially in that heavy duty equipment, the emergency equipment, that'll take a little longer. It's good to hear that you are actually going to publish your findings and your plan, because part of, uh, I think the part of the way we, we get closer to having smart cities is sharing the lessons learned, right? Um, because not everyone has the resources of a New York City or a Miami. There are a lot of communities in here that really would benefit from having the lessons learned right in front of them. And, I, and I'll just preview the, the, the core result about the good news. 85% of our fleet, we operate 160 types of vehicles. We operate a little of every business that is out there. About 85% of that fleet, you can electrify within the next three to five years. About 15% of it, those electric options don't yet exist in the viable way we need them. And by the way, because since so many represent cities, you know, it's great to have an electric pickup truck, and obviously there is now some in the market. If they can't plow, that's kind of a problem. Not for Miami Beach, 
<laughs> but uh, you know, I grew up in Boston and moved to New York. And the places I hang out, things like plowing are big issues. Some of these other work type applications. I saw a lot of your Miami Beach equipment operating on the sand. You need electric 4x4. Four four. Those beach equipment pieces doing your sand maintenance, which you do get to do all year round. We don't have to worry about that in the same way. Where you're going to need electric equipment with 4x4. Four four. So it does get a little in the weeds on the... It's one thing to say you have an electric vehicle. Do you have an electric vehicle? Can it actually do the functions that you need vehicles for? Gets a little bit more involved. All right. So thank you very much. Ulyss, we're coming to you now. Uh, and one of the things I really would like to talk to you about is, are, is innovation and mass transit. And so can you help us uh, understand or become informed about what may be your most innovation forward project you have that's in the, under your department to, for mass transit? Sure, absolutely, and thank you for the question. And um, thanks, Keith, for sending all your folks from New York down to Miami. It's the reason why we're struggling with the housing price prices now. So, but um, there's there's a couple things. The question is focused on mass transit, but we do have a project that um, meets our edict as a department. We have a new vision for our department where we're trying to be the world's best provider of transportation options, and we actually have the largest. Um, ITS and, and ATMS, so Advanced Traffic Management um, Systems Project in the world. Um, we have in Miami-Dade County, so this is inclusive of all of the 34 municipalities within Miami-Dade County, we have a project that will upgrade uh, our 3,000 signals to make them uh, be ones that are adaptive, so we can actually control traffic. The benefit of being able to do that will allow of course, our transit system to be able to navigate uh, through many of our intersections in a more efficient manner, but it'll just provide our operations team with the data that's necessary to be more proactive to actually manage traffic through our ATMS system. So we're in the process now of actually uh, f wrapping up the design uh, and initial testing phase. Um, we are, we've identified a corridor on, on the north uh, west part of the county uh, to work out all of the bugs and then over the next two years we'll be uh, replacing all of our traffic controllers uh, with a new controller that would allow us to be much more adaptive and manage our system. So, so that's going to have a, a ton of benefits um, across the board. It'll also uh, provide benefits for our pedestrian and, and, and bicyclists uh, that are navigating across our system. Uh, as a part of this project, we actually are partnering uh, and have an app called Seabike, which allows a user to be recognized by our traffic controllers and our signals, and thereby doing so would be able to collect information on pedestrian and bicycle counts as well to be in a better position to make sure that we have the proper signal timing for those types of modes of transportation. So that, that's on the infrastructure side that has benefits for mass transit. Um, uh, piggybacking, Keith, on, on what you're doing in, in the fleet side, we actually are um, moving forward and meeting a goal from uh, Mayor Kava, who you heard from this morning. One of our four E platforms it has to do with the environment. The other three E's are economy, um, uh, 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 equity, and engagement. And so uh, the environment platform is a direction from her to the department and to the county to figure out ways that we can electrify our fleet. And so we're taking that responsibility um, head on where we currently have a contract where we are receiving 75 uh, electric buses from Proterra. We've started to receive delivery of those buses in the past uh, two weeks. And within the next six months, we will have our first um, allotment of that 75, which will be 32 buses in hand at our three facilities. Um, we actually installed 25 charging stations at our three different uh, uh, bus facilities um, uh, that we currently have, which is just as an important fact that you have to have the infrastructure to be able to accommodate uh, the electrification of, of your fleet. And so we're, we're taking that head on. And then we also have another uh, procurement that is on the street now for an additional 100 electric buses. Um, and there's a portion of that procurement that uh, we will have uh, approximately uh, 25 to 40 buses dedicated to our South Corridor uh, Rapid Transit project that we're building out, which is a 20-mile 
uh, expansion of a bus rapid transit system uh, that will connect Florida City to Dayton South, and then that connection will allow people to be able to access our Metro Rail and get to points downtown. That 20 mile South Day Transit Way is one of the longest and most electrified BRT systems in the country. And that's how we're meeting that edict from an environmental standpoint, but also showing some innovation uh, in the mass transit space. So, so I kind of stopped there. Those are two examples, um, but we're doing quite a bit. And uh, uh, hopefully those of you came in the, the convention center today, you look to your left, you saw uh, an autonomous vehicle um, that's beautifully designed and striped. Mr. Carlos Cruz Casas has helped out with that and our partners with Beep. Um, that we're excited about that vehicle. Take a look at uh, that uh, d test and demo vehicle. By next week, hopefully, uh, we will be um, piloting that autonomous vehicle at uh, the, the zoo, uh, which is in District 9, which is in the southern part of, of the county. So those are just some innovations that uh, we're moving forward with. That's great, thank you. And I can attest that, that Carlos is an amazing advocate for you for what you're doing in Miami-Dade County. Uh, uh, I heard he got a promotion earlier. <laughs> yes, I so saw that. So we're gonna that. have to talk it's about like he's that. he's the mayor, Carlos. right, I saw that. Right? I meant to do a joke with him about that, right. Uh, ben, I do wanna come back to you for a moment. We are talking about digital innovation, right? And so people are out there, agencies are collecting a lot of data uh, through, the, through the implementation of, of digital innovation. What do you want to caution us about with collecting that data or what, are the, what should we know about collecting that data and how should, we, how should we be prepared to use it, quite honestly? Sure. I, you know, I think that we are probably, over the course of the next coming decade, going to see a sea change in the ways that... Um, probably all governments at the state and local level, but particularly transportation agencies will have to think about data management um, and data intake. I mean, I think that's already such a huge consideration, but as we kind of think about the broad range of, of data inputs that are available and increasingly thinking about uh, electrification and smart grid integration and instrumentation across our roadways and traffic signals, I think that it just every, uh, every additional sort of um, uh, node creates a networked uh, system that becomes harder and harder to um, to kind of wrap your head around. So I think there's just going to have to be a way of, of thinking about and resourcing those issues um, in every public sector entity across the country. Um, but I think there's also probably huge opportunities to just make use of and, and so, so I think that bigger picture is like, okay, we're going to be moving into this world where everything's instrumented, where we're going to have massive data collection needs, where we have to be thinking incredibly deeply about privacy, about data ethics and civil rights, about edge computing and all the like both technical and socio-technical dimensions that that brings and making sure that we are uh, staffing state and local governments to think about that uh, and county, uh, county governments to think about that in the appropriate way. I also think there are huge opportunities to just say, what's the data that we have now at our fingertips that's not talking to each other, and how do we connect it? So how do we think about the transit systems and their connection to zoning rules about zoning, about housing? And I think there's just incredible opportunities for what's on the books. And so I guess the, um, I'm not sure I'm in a position to tell people what to do or what not to do, but I think I would encourage, I think there is this tendency of we just need one more way of measuring one more thing and then we're gonna, um, and then we're gonna solve all of our problems. And I think oftentimes there's maybe uh, the opportunity to look inward and think about data integration and data management and stewardship of what's, what's currently on the table and, and that may present a lot of opportunities. But certainly in the context of smart grants and other, and Safe Streets for All that was mentioned, I think that the data foundation of the projects that um, that at DOT we're supporting um, are critical. And we recognize that um, we can talk about climate, we can talk about equity, we can talk about um, economic competitiveness and safety, but if you don't, if you're not measuring those things, if you're not tracking them, uh, then then they're very hard goals to achieve. And so um, we are very, we're, we're thinking about that very intentionally through all of our grant programs. I'm sure for those uh, that, that did participate in the Safe Streets for All, um, uh, notice a funding opportunity. I, I know that that was central and, and I think will continue to be an important theme across the department. Excellent, thank you. And Ulyss, I heard you saying that you, that you are investing in digital infrastructure pretty significantly. Why, why is that important? 
and how does how does the average person benefit from that? Yeah, so so digital infrastructure is important because it's really about uh, placing infrastructure and assets out in the field so you can collect data. So that data can transition into information so you can better manage your, your infrastructure and your assets. And, and so it's important that you know, we do that with the respect uh, and related to our ATMS project. We actually have another project that uh, we are updating all of our street lights uh, where we have the ability to transition to LED street lights, but at the same time we'll be adding cameras as well as other sensors to do a better job in detecting traffic uh, from a mobility standpoint. And so we'll be able to collect that information and then that's gonna help off with re respect to planning and just overall operations of our system. Um, the one thing I would mention is that, uh, you know, it's been talked about with respect to infrastructure and its historical impact on communities from an equity standpoint. And we oftentimes think about it in the context of a, of a bridge that may be built or not built, uh, that does not connect the community, or as a primary example here in Miami, um, the historical impact that uh, I-395 and 95 made to a traditionally African-American neighborhood called Overtown, uh, which basically split that community and dispersed uh, approximately 80 families uh, to the northern side of the county. Um, we're still dealing with that uh, disparate impact today, and I always talk about from a digital or information or tech standpoint that we don't want to repeat those same issues today by implementing a different type of infrastructure. And so those of you who are in the uh, tech and the infrastructure game or collecting information, make sure that it's being done to help promote everybody and that we're not inadvertently creating additional barriers by being excited about the impact that different digital infrastructure is about. Um, Equity, you know, we talk about it in, in, a, in a term based off of its impact, but the ability to have the proper investment boils down to the data that you collect. And so equity is really mu much more of a data exercise which transitions into an asset management approach to make sure that the areas and the assets and the people that need the most attention um, and need the most help, receive the most resources. And that's really what equity is supposed to be about. So I just want to make, make mention of that because um, uh, that's uh, the direction we're going to be going in as a department and uh, making sure that uh, we have the proper tools in place uh, to really leverage our digital infrastructure to collect the proper data to make those good decisions. No, thank you for doing that because uh, that one is, a, is one that, that's a little trickier and we have to pay close attention to if you're putting up something that's a tangible physical structure you can see the immediate impact of it and the inequity that's associated with it but something like a digital uh, infrastructure that is in the background is not visible to the common person you don't even know that you are either positively or negatively impacted until it's too late right yeah, so that is right. We need to think about that in advance. Keith, I do want to come back to you with, with uh, one conversation. You said you had 36 or over 3,600 vehicles that are, are now either hybrid or all electric. Is that correct? They're plug in, yep. Plug in, okay. So in order to make that happen, to me, that's a success story, right? But in order to make that happen, you had to get everyone on the same page. And that seems to usually be the biggest hurdle. How did you how did you all make that happen, or what was the catalyst for bringing people together to see a single vision of why this was important? Well, I mean, one, you have leadership, so we have climate goals that we've put out there: fifty percent greenhouse gas reduction by twenty twenty five, coming very soon; eighty percent by twenty thirty five. Um, but then, of course, you have to sell these vehicles on a day-to-day -day basis, right? We do not invest in fleet vehicles solely to reduce emissions, right? If I put out a vehicle for a major agency that's providing services and it can't perform that function, then you have a real problem and, and we're going to go somewhere else. So some of the important things, I mentioned maintenance. We're getting maintenance savings from these vehicles. We're actually getting a true return on investment. We do a lot of our electrification as budget savings initiatives. The budget's actually reduced for these initiatives. Um, resiliency. So if you operate a police department, especially in a hot weather place like here, you know you have enormous 
overheating issues and transmission issues with vehicles, um, police department vehicles, ambulances, idle, sanitation trucks, idle during most of their operations. Well, you know, hybrid and electric systems solve your idling, which also solves your maintenance issues and your, your breakdown issues. So you're getting cost savings um, in, in that part of what you're doing. Um, and frankly, a lot of these vehicles are really high performance vehicles. Um, you know, I almost want to do a show of hands. Who here has actually driven an electric car? All right. You know, did it perform better or worse than the gas car you had before? You know, they're fast. I mean, we don't want them to be fast, right? We want them to be slow. We just announced Intelligent Speed Assist, an automated program, talking about technology, to make sure vehicles can't speed, right? But you know, a lot of these are high performance vehicles. There's a reason that the top luxury vehicles in the world happen to be electric cars. Not the top electric cars, but the, you know, not the top luxury electric cars, but the top straight up vehicles. So partly, you know, we're trying to prove these technologies on the ground in very difficult places, right? You know, these are tough applications when you're out in New York City responding to emergencies, cleaning, maintaining the streets. Um, but the good news is we've been able to do that. The maintenance level, at the resiliency level, at the performance level. Not in every case we've had our not so great implementations, not too many of them. We don't talk too much about them. We try and move on and talk about what's working, but the good news, most of it um, is working. Um, I do want to mention just really quickly since um, telematics and information, we have in invested enormously in telematics, which we, we live track currently 36,000 vehicles. It's the largest public live tracking program in the US. We've used that to implement things like intelligent speed assist, where you can actually manage speeds. We think about the real terrible issues with crashes. You talk about equity. Crashes are mostly impacting um, communities that are, that are ha having more difficulties. Um, and so we think technology can really move efficiency. We launched with Mayor Adams' first initiative for fleet was saving money through telematics, reducing the fleet, making it more efficient, cost savings. But then also, we just announced Intelligent Speed Assist, this whole idea, we know speeding is behind so many of the crashes that are just absolutely horrific. I'll give you a financial number. New York City spends $160 million a year on fleet litigation. Just our fleet, just claims. What would your city do with $160 million? So we think there's enormous potential to use telematics information, not only to save money, make your fleets more efficient, but for things like safety and, and intelligence speed assist. And there's a reason I pitched that is because you might be getting something uh, on the right side you know, about that very soon. So we think there's a lot. Um, and there's an opportunity as you electrify, you can redesign the vehicle. And so you don't have to electrify a vehicle in the same design, whether conventional, high vision, new telematics, new design. Take the opportunity to electrify and redesign the vehicle completely. All right. And then we just have a couple of minutes left. I'm going to wrap up with Euless. I'm going to ask you a trick question. How do I get on one of those scooters out there and not break my neck? Ooh, um, very carefully. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, uh, speaking of scooters, we, we um, and it's, it's unique here in Florida that the municipalities, which we're in one, they have their own scooter programs. Um, we are actively working to create a countywide uh, program. So what we're finding is that uh, due to the fact that the and enabling legislation from the state allows these disparate scooter programs to exist, that we want the user to be able to use it and be consistent and understand how to use them, regardless of what they are in the county. So yeah, so we we are we're partnering right now. We're we're going through a um, data collection uh, 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 assessment to make sure the standards for data um, are being submitted uh, comprehensively and are are ones that are standard. And so we can help our municipalities and develop a countywide program that. You can go ahead and get on a scooter in Miami Beach, or if you go to City of Miami, or if you go to Sweetwater uh, in a, in, on Incorporated, you can be able to do it. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Help me in uh, thanking my panelists for today. We hope that you enjoyed today's session, and we hope that you learned something new. And don't hesitate to speak to our panelists after the session.
Thank you very much.